This Humankind special, Justice Denied, is produced in association with WGBH Boston and supported by the Humankind Program Fund and a special grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. You've got white and black abolitionists. They've got axes, handles. They've got, you know, I mean, they are prepared to go in there and take Burns out. They're not gonna let this happen. When an escaped slave is arrested in Boston before the Civil War, it provokes the biggest abolitionist protest America had ever seen. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. A century and a half ago, Abraham Lincoln took perhaps the boldest stand in his stormy presidency. Seventeen months into the Civil War, Lincoln announced in 1862 he would issue a proclamation emancipating the slaves in America. People of color, denied in half the nation all basic freedoms accorded to whites, would now be equal citizens everywhere. The cruelty of slavery was depicted two years earlier in a July 4th oration by the escaped slave Frederick Douglass. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the South. I see bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest tides ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. A heated argument over whether slavery is moral went unresolved by the founders of America. When they drafted their constitution in 1787, slavery was sanctioned. It went so far as to mandate that the rights of a slaveholder to own human beings be respected even in free states, and that slaves who escaped from the South be returned to their owner. The system for handling runaways evolved over decades and was formalized in the Fugitive Slave Act passed by Congress in 1850. Should a legal dispute arise, it would go before a U.S. commissioner, a special judge, to be appointed by the federal circuit courts throughout the nation. Professor Paul Finkelman specializes in the legal history of slavery at Albany Law School. In a hearing before the U.S. commissioner, the alleged slave is not allowed to testify on his own behalf and indeed is not allowed to be called as a witness. The alleged fugitive slave may have an attorney if one shows up, but he is certainly not uh, promised an attorney or guaranteed an attorney. Critics of this law complain that the alleged slave was denied basic due process afforded any other accused person in federal court proceedings. In a case of mistaken identity, how could you prove who you were without the right to testify on your own behalf? It was in this legal no-man's land that Anthony Burns, a 19-year-old black man, suddenly found himself ensnared in Boston in 1854. Within days, it would ignite the largest anti-slavery protest the nation had ever seen. Albert von Frank in Pullman, Washington, is author of The Trials of Anthony Burns. Burns was born in 1834 in Stafford County, Virginia, um, to a family whose father worked on a quarry from which the, uh, uh, the buildings in Washington, D.C. were uh, uh, regularly uh, made. Burns was barely literate. Uh, he, he managed, while still a slave, to cajole some people into giving him some, fundament, uh, some uh, uh, instruction. Uh, and he was also a very religious uh, person um, and became a kind of informal Baptist minister to other slaves so that he would uh, perform marriages and officiate at funerals, for example. Um, and I think that was very important when he gets to Boston and, and uh, people uh, are much more sympathetic to him on, on that basis. Unlike many slaves, Anthony Burns was not based at a plantation regarded as property under Virginia law. His labor was literally rented out by his owner, Charles Suttle. In 1854, Burns was loaned to a druggist in Richmond, Virginia, who discovered he didn't have enough work for the teenager and instructed him to go out and find day labor, for which, of course, the druggist would retain wages earned by Burns. He went down to the uh, docks in Richmond 
and quickly found a ship bound for Boston with a friendly northern sailor on board. So he stowed away in February and uh, arrived in in rather poor shape uh, in Boston some three weeks later. On arriving in an unfamiliar northern city, Anthony Burns managed quickly to connect with people who could help him establish a new way of living in Boston as a free man. Escaping aboard ship from Richmond was not unusual, so you had a number of people here who uh, were from Virginia, um, a very organized and supportive community. Beverly Morgan Welch directs the Museum of African American History in Boston. They help people with um, food, lodging, clothing, medical expenses when they arrive in the city. And they give reports of, of this um, to the community. They talk about and understand what it is to transition from, a, um, from kidnap, enslavement, uh, self-emancipation, uh, kind of this orienting yourself to a new life. And they understand it's going to be difficult. They understand that they have to have employment, uh, a church, and uh, an education that will help them to cope and to become uh, productive members of the society. But helping escaped slaves adjust to a newfound freedom was only part of their mission. This community has a long history of its abolitionist activity. Uh, from the Massachusetts General Colored Association in 1826 uh, to the formation of the New England Anti-Slavery Society at the African Meeting House uh, in Boston. Um, This is a group of people born free, self-emancipated, self-liberated, purchasing their own freedom, and they understand that being organized is extremely important. A dozen years earlier, Boston anti-slavery activists rallied behind George Latimer, a slave who escaped from Virginia and was arrested as a fugitive. The groundswell of public reaction showed the strength of the budding abolitionist cause in Massachusetts. By the time they finish their um, fight for this, 65,000 people in Massachusetts have signed a petition that rolled up is, is, is the size of a small barrel, they say. So they know that they are continually pushing the envelope, must be vigilant, organized, and they are politically very active. Is the movement, in fact, gaining uh, support and and momentum? It gains great support, uh, certainly, after this Burns incident. Shortly after arriving in Boston, Anthony Burns joined a Baptist congregation and found employment in a clothing store operated by the church deacon. When Burns's owner in Virginia discovers the whereabouts of his runaway slave, he travels to Boston to have Burns arrested. The case is heard by United States Circuit Court Commissioner Edward Loring, also then serving as a state court probate judge. Well, Loring is a complicated guy. Legal historian Paul Finkelman. He's the first cousin of one of the leading abolitionist lawyers in, in Boston, uh, ironically. Loring is a part-time uh, professor at Harvard Law School. He is a full-time judge in Massachusetts. And like many f- other lawyers, he's a federal commissioner. Uh, being a federal commissioner is useful. It's an honor. Uh, it's not particularly lucrative. And he is the federal commissioner that they find to bring uh, the Burns case to. He has the hearing very early in the morning. He wants to get Burns certified and out of there as quickly as possible. And everything would have gone according to plan, except that a young lawyer named Richard Henry Dana, who is also a author of a very well-known book two years before the mast, Richard Henry Dana walks by the courtroom, sees what's going on, walks in, and says, I'm here to represent this man. Now, of course, Dana doesn't even know who he's representing. Burns doesn't know him. But this slows everything down, and eventually Dana convinces Loring that fidelity to the rule of law requires that Burns be allowed to decide whether he wants an attorney or not. 
let me ask a little bit more about Loring. So you say he was the cousin of a leading abolitionist. What do we know of his own views on the abolitionist movement and specifically of the fugitive slave law? Well, earlier in his life, he might very well have been kind of sympathetic to moderate anti-slavery. He slides off that and ends up being what's known as a cotton Whig. So he is a conservative who is going to do the what the law requires. He isn't concerned about black people. He isn't concerned about the fate of a slave. And he's perfectly willing to ramrod the hearing to get Burns down as fast as possible. However, he's also a law teacher at Harvard. He also has to hang out with respectable lawyers. And when Dana confronts him and basically says, you as a Massachusetts lawyer cannot allow this to happen without real due process of law, Loring is stuck in a very hard place and he concedes that Burns should go back to jail and decide whether or not he wants a lawyer. And next thing you know, you have this six-day hearing before Judge Loring, which is not something Judge Loring wanted. We're examining a pivotal moment in the American abolitionist movement, the case of a young escaped slave from Virginia, which provoked the loudest anti-slavery protest the nation had ever seen. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this program, please visit humanmedia.org. In the mind of Edward Loring, who had been appointed by the federal court to hear fugitive slave cases, the fate of Anthony Burns turned on a narrow legal question. Is the accused man before him in fact Burns or someone else? Judge Loring to defense counsel Richard Dana. In my opinion, Burns' status as a free man has yet to be established. I suggest you present this court with concrete evidence as to his identity. A delay of two days is reasonable. This court shall reconvene on Monday morning at 11 o'clock. Word rapidly spread among Boston's abolitionist community that an alleged fugitive slave was being held downtown in an improvised jail cell at Court Square near Boston Common. Three years earlier, anti-slavery activists had rescued Shadrach Minkins, an escaped slave then being held in Boston by federal marshals. A placard about the Anthony Burns arrest in 1854 was widely posted throughout the city. A man kidnapped. A public meeting will be held at Faneuil Hall this Friday evening, May 26th at 7 o'clock to secure justice for a man claimed as a slave by a Virginia kidnapper and imprisoned in the Boston courthouse in defiance of the laws of Massachusetts. At the time of the American Revolution, fiery orations rang out from the stage of Faneuil Hall. Now with a fugitive slave incarcerated a few blocks away, the week he turned 20 years old, the spirit of rebellion in Boston was rekindled. Ted Kulik conducts history tours around Boston. What's going on at Faneuil Hall is a series of meetings where the speakers are connecting the revolution to this event. They're saying, are we not the sons of John Adams and Samuel Adams and James Otis and John Hancock? Is this not the city of liberty? Can we allow a man to be placed in chains, sent back into slavery from this city? Black and white people have gathered to make certain that Burns is freed. Beverly Morgan Welch of the Museum of African American History. There is um, much gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands, but there is a lot of planning going on trying to free Burns, and they'll do anything. You know, you've got white and black uh, abolitionists um, who, 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 you know, I mean, they've got axes, uh, handles. They've got, you know, I mean, they are prepared to go in there and take Burns out. They're not going to let this happen. Tour guide Ted Kulik in Court Square today. And a man named Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a Unitarian pastor, who is very much an adamant abolitionist who had moved away from pacifism toward kind of a necessary violence in the fight against slavery. Higginson yells out to this crowd from the cradle of liberty, which we know is the nickname for Faneuil Hall, to the tomb of liberty. Hundreds of men come over here. They they create a, a makeshift battering ram along the way. 
They break into the building. There's a bit of a firefight. One guard is shot to death. Higginson's actually slashed with a knife. Many severe injuries, but they're not able to get Burns out. The aborted attempt to rescue Anthony Burns heightened the tension and the stakes at the legal hearing that would resume on Monday. The nation was already gripped that year in a debate over whether slavery would be allowed in the new territories of Kansas and Nebraska. The enforcement of slave laws was repugnant to many Northerners, and not all jurisdictions chose to follow the fugitive slave law. The Wisconsin Supreme Court that year upheld a ruling that declared the fugitive slave law to be unconstitutional. In Boston, where Virginia slave owner Charles Suttle demanded the return of his runaway slave, Judge Loring weighed the law. Legal historian Paul Finkelman. Loring could have written an opinion saying, I support the fugitive slave law. I would be happy to return a fugitive slave if you bring one before me. But Mr. Suttle has said that Burns escaped on this date, and I have three or four reputable citizens of Boston who say Burns was here three or four weeks before that. And therefore, I have no choice but to conclude that Mr. Suttle has arrested the wrong black here in Boston, and I'm going to order his release. The slave owner, it turned out, was actually mistaken about the date when Anthony Burns stowed away on the boat in Richmond. But the discrepancy allowed defense lawyer Richard Dana to poke a hole in the legal case against Burns. Albert von Frank. That was Dana's uh, whole legal strategy in the proceeding, was to give Loring uh, uh, a colorable pretense for taking the side of freedom against slavery. Because in addition to the alibi witness, uh, he managed to point out that uh, Anthony Burns was uh, mortgaged so that uh, technically uh, the right to recover goes to the mortgagee uh, and that he was sublet and, and uh, so that no service and labor was due to subtle. So he had no right to recover. People are hoping that Loring, he's been given a way out, even though some of this testimony may uh, have been true or not. You know, he's being given a lot of ways to go, and they are hoping and praying that Loring will do the the right thing. Meanwhile, the pastor of Burns's church, Leonard Grimes, had raised the sum of $1,200 to purchase Burns from the slave owner in order to set him free. But the deal, which the owner and the judge initially approved, fell through when the U.S. district attorney objected. In the end, Judge Loring finds that the accused slave in the courtroom is in fact Anthony Burns, who is remanded to the custody of his owner. And to enforce the ruling just days after the failed rescue attempt at the courthouse, downtown Boston became an armed camp. 2,000 U.S. troops stood guard. Tour guide Ted Kulik. This is a federal case that the nation is looking at. The president is Franklin Pierce, who just hates the abolitionist movement. He hates the radical Boston element. He's going to send these Marines here to send a point. It's much more than Anthony Burns. It's a statement that the federal government, led by the president, is behind the Fugitive Slave Law. It is not going to compromise. They are not going to let Boston challenge this law. With the court having issued its order, Anthony Burns would be marched through the streets of Boston nearly a mile from the courthouse to a boat waiting at what is today Long Wharf. Burns is placed in chains. You have the 2,000 Marines. You also have a local militia. Uh, primarily uh, primarily Irish Catholic from Boston's North End, led by Thomas Cass, which is also going to create more tension. Many of the abolitionists were uh, harsh critics of Catholicism. Uh, Catholicism at the time is seen as very anti-democratic. Uh, there are no uh, Catholic abolitionist groups in Boston. So you have a whole tension then within the Bostonians in their view of it as well. Citizens stream by the thousands onto the streets in protest. They witnessed the spectacle of a young black man being forced to leave the temporary freedom he had tasted in Boston and return to the harsh life of a slave. The the estimates for that crowd are 50,000 Bostonians, the largest anti-slavery protest in the country at that point. So you have 50,000 Bostonians out protesting the return of Burns against approximately 2,500 militia and Marines. The population of Boston was far smaller in the 1850s 
This must have been a huge outpouring of public sentiment. Many of them were Boston, Bostonians who were anti-slavery, not necessarily would call themselves abolitionists. They so believe they're not part of an organized movement, it was just part, their personal views. Not part of an organized movement, but also not in the not sharing the belief that slavery should be ended immediately, very much in the very much in the belief that it should be ended over time politically and without violence. But when they have a Bostonian captured in their city, that forces people who are generally moderate, who might say, yes, I'm opposed to slavery, but I don't want to go to an extreme. Now, with the reality of a Bostonian in chains in their own city, accompanied by really hard to overstate uh, the importance of Uncle Tom's Cabin two years earlier as well. The publication of that, the publication of that of Uncle Tom's book Cabin, which occurs re only revealing months. the horrors of slavery. Right. Uncle Tom's Cabin really, it's been described, I think, accurately as the most important book in American history by far. It's actually published uh, only about, only a few blocks from here. And so where were the 50,000 people gathered? Do we they're, have a sense of that? Yes, they're right along the streets here, really packed in. And they're right down to the end of the war. Very importantly, many of them are the merchants of Boston, who are only a few blocks from here. So they're going to go right down State Street, which is the center of the merchants and the bankers and investors. Now, what's so important about this is, this is a group that had traditionally been very moderate, or even conservative, on the issue of slavery. They didn't want to offend their partners in the South. They had a lot of shared cotton investments. And up to this point, they've been kind of on the fence. But now, with Kansas, Nebraska, Uncle Tom's Cabin, all these things, we see a change in the merchants as well. They actually hang black curtains from their offices, signifying the death of liberty. Many of them turn uh, pictures of Franklin Pierce, paintings of Franklin Pierce, rather. Then the president. Then the president, upside down, to show their disdain for Pierce at this time. Many of the buildings were hung with black crepe. Uh, there were various kinds of protest symbolism. Uh, one, a, a coffin that was hoisted up by ropes uh, that said uh, liberty on it. Uh, there were obviously a great many armed uh, militia and U.S. Uh, uh, armed forces uh, trying to control the crowd. Um, and keep uh, keep the, the populace out from the, the away from the cortege. This was itself a, a kind of an, an issue because uh, the the the, uh, the city did not want to be looked upon as assisting the rendition of a slave. One Boston police captain resigned from the force to protest the assignment. But the grim trek by 20-year-old Anthony Burns to the boat that would lead him back to slavery proceeded without interruption. Albert von Frank. So they, they, they had one cannon that was part of this procession, uh, which when they got that down to the wharf along with Burns, they put the, the cannon on the, on the boat and took away into the uh, harbor where they met uh, another ship that would take uh, Burns back to Virginia. At churches as far away as Springfield and Worcester, bells tolled in solemn observance at the judicial rendition of a young slave who had run away to freedom. Anthony Burns, now back in the custody of his master, set sail from Massachusetts to Virginia on a melancholy voyage. He was at first put in jail, and then he went uh, very shortly after that to the notorious slave pen run by Robert Lopkin uh, in Richmond. And he was tossed into a room, an unventilated room at the top of the building and held there in chains for four months. And almost at the point of death, he was taken out, shined up and put on auction by uh, Suttle and sold for, I believe, $905 to a man named McDaniel who lived in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, who bought him basically as a kind of speculation. Eventually, uh, people in the north found, found out where Burns was uh, and an effort was uh, started once again to purchase him. And uh, uh, Leonard Grimes, uh, who is, I think, the hero in all of this, uh, succeeded in raising money. He went to Baltimore where Burns was handed off in exchange for two checks. And Burns then came back by way of New York City where he gave an address to to Boston, 
Subsequently, he did a certain amount of uh, lecturing, anti-slavery lecturing, but uh, he also got a um, donated scholarship to Oberlin. Oberlin College in Ohio. Which had, of course, a a famous anti-slavery reputation. Uh, And he was trained there for a while and then took over uh, a a church in Indianapolis, a black uh, Baptist church. Then because of the... uh, Indiana black laws. He was forced out from there. He went to St. Catharines in Canada where he ran another church and died from tuberculosis in 1862. Anthony Burns was 28. The judge in the Burns case, Edward Loring, met with widespread scorn after handing down his controversial ruling. Well, Commissioner Loring has a kind of sad life. Paul Finkelman. Shortly after this, no one in Boston of any high society will talk to him. He goes to the market. His butcher won't sell him meat. Uh, People ignore him. They turn away from him. He becomes a pariah. And uh, he is subsequently relieved of his position at Harvard Law School, not particularly because of this, but because of other things. He is then removed from his position as a judge of the probate court because the legislature believes that anyone who would return a fugitive slave would be unfit to judge the affairs of orphans and widows. Anthony Burns died two months before President Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation. Burns's remarkable short life dramatized the inhumanity of slavery and prejudice and affirmed his guiding principle to keep the faith. Beverly Morgan Welch. I think that um, it's amazing that after what occurred, um, that he would be able to go on um, to Oberlin and to um, um, continue to be a, a, a minister, but not unlike so many others who had a deep belief, had a supportive community, and believed that uh, ultimately that not only their religious beliefs, but their belief that uh, the Declaration of Independence um, uh, would stand and that eventually the country would become the democracy that it said it wanted to be. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. Studio recording by Antonio Oliart Rose. Editorial assistance from Thomas Royal and Kathy Graham. Research director Jeffrey White. Dramatizations by Philip Martin, Don Goonan, and Laura Carlo. Paul Finkelman joined us from the studios of Duke University, where he served as visiting professor of law. Albert von Frank joined us from Northwest Public Radio. We included an excerpt from The Trial of Anthony Burns, written by Wendy Lament and Bethany Dunnigan. Webmaster Brian K. Johnson. Special thanks to Lisa Mullins and Tony Buck. Our program is produced by Human Media in association with WGBH Boston. Program development provided by Shart Media. To purchase a CD copy of this program, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. That's 1-800-5-L-I-S-T-E-N. Or visit our website where you can also obtain an audio download of this and our other programs and can hear selected episodes free. You can access free written materials related to this program as well. Our web address is humanmedia.org. Again, if you'd like to purchase a CD copy of Humankind by phone, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN, and our web address is humanmedia.org. This segment, Justice Denied, Part 1, is Humankind Program Number 183. The executive producer is David Freudberg. This is Humankind.